What is up, YouTube? This is Red Leprechaun Gaming, and welcome back to He Who Fights with Monsters, Book 2 by Chateloon. Chapter 26 Manifestation. Four people were in Sophie and Belinda's guest suite as images played on a crystal recording projector. Sophie and Belinda were both present, as were Phoebe and Jory. Phoebe had brought the recording crystal while Belinda had roped Jory into taking a day off. He had been reluctant at first, but he hadn't taken a break since the clinic reopened. With a priest of the healer on hand, he let himself be talked into it. Phoebe was the only one who had seen the recording of Jason's fight before. The others looked on with various reactions as they followed the recording from the perspective of Rick and his team. That laughter is creepy, Melinda said. I knew there was... I knew there was a dark side to Jason, Jory said, but this is a bit much. A bit much is right, Sophie said. He's being a complete ham. Wait, why is he stepping out into the open? He's just going to get speared. See, what did I say? Belinda put her hand over her mouth in horror. Did he just lick the spear? They watched until the recording ended, freezing with the image of Jason with his foot on the back of Jonah's head, drowning him in the mud. That was horrifying, Belinda said. You had that guy chasing you. It wasn't real, Jory said, although his words sounded empty. It was theatrics, Sophie said. Get into an opponent's head and you've already beaten them. That kind of over-the-top ridiculousness would only work on people with no real experience. A melodious chime rang, indicating a visitor to the door. Belinda got up to let in Clive and Jason. Oh, Jason said sadly as he recognized the frozen image of himself and Jonah. I don't, that li I don't like that recording being out there. Given how absurd you were, I can see why, Sophie said. You spend the whole time playing ridiculous mind games instead of just taking them out. I didn't have the skills for that approach, Jason said. There were five of them, and, I and going monster was the only thing I could think of to mess with their heads. If they were thinking straight, I would have lost. I'll admit it's good to show people what, what you'll do if they cross you, Sophie said. Next time, cut out the maniacal laughter and stick to the horrifying death. That bit at the end where you drowned the guy in mud was good. That man in the mud, Jason said softly. His name was Jonah. He's dead for real now, along with a number, another member of that group. I have no interest in watching myself kill them. I think it's time for you to head off, Soph, Belinda said. You go fight monsters or whatever. Jory and I have a picnic. Jory and I are going to have a picnic. We are, Jory asked. Yes, Belinda said. Thank you again for making up the basket, Jason. No worries. Jason, Humphrey, Clive, and Sophie were in a wood were in the woodmill region of the Delta, in the middle of a plantation forest. Their objective was a pack of monsters called flannards. Flannards were emaciated creatures with forearms and distended jaws full of pointed teeth. Individually, they were even weaker than Margols, but they appeared in even larger groups. Their numbers made them perfect for exploring team tactics, which is the reason Humphrey had selected that particular contract. The thick plantation of trees had them growing in neat rows. Fighting amongst them, Sophie led three of the creatures between the trunks and into a waiting sword of Humphrey. He stepped out with a horizontal sweep that cleaved two of them in half, while the other dropped to the ground, the bade the blade barely passing over it. It sprang up and resumed its pursuit of Sophie. Three more had been chasing after Jason, but had lost him in the shadows. Spotting Sophie rush past, they joined the new, her now lone pursuer. Sophie scrambled, seemingly in panic as they joined the chase. She changed direction and the monsters followed. Without noticing the odd mark on one of the trees, they dashed blindly after Sophie. Until the sound of Clive snapping his fingers preceded the ground underneath them, blasting upwards with the force of his magical explosion, tearing them all to pieces. Humphrey came jogging through the woods, joining Sophie and Clive. That was good, Jason said, emerging from a shadow. Nice plan, Humphrey. The key is to stay flexible, Humphrey said. Situations always change, and rigid plans don't work. Rather than overcomplicated stratagems, if we have learned and practiced series of flexible tactics... We can rapidly adapt those to any changing situations. This was one of the simpler tactics outlined in the booklets I gave you all. I can't believe you wrote those, Jason said. When you do something, you don't mess about, Humphrey. I think we're all pretty impressed. The others nodded in agreement. 
Now we have them, Humphrey said. We need to make sure that we learn them with our heads, then practice until we know them. If we combine shared knowledge of a flexible tactic set with a communications advantage of Jason's ability, we'll be ready to react to any situation. Like a malevolent gold ranker who forces us into a knitting competition with our lives on the line, Jason said. What? Humphrey asked. The others looked at Jason with confusion. Humphrey said any situation, so I posited a situation we might encounter. How is that helpful? Sophie asked. Fine, Humphrey said. We'll be ready for most situations. These tactics are all preliminary, though. They're worth learning to get in the habit but they need to be adjusted once we get a healer and learn the capabilities, plus fill out our abilities, advance to bronze, and so on. We'll be adjusting and readjusting in an ongoing manner. Any word on our healer? Clive asked. Melissa Devone paid my mother a visit last night at our townhouse in the city, Humphrey said. Devone is at least considering joining us. How many abilities have you left to awaken? Jason asked Humphrey. Two, Humphrey said. One from the magic essence and one from the might essence. What about you? Three, two from dark and one from doom. I still have eight to go, Sophie said. Still early days for you, Humphrey said. Jason and I gained our essences months ago. Getting as many as you have in under a single month is a good start. After Jason looted the monsters, they set out back for the city. The woodmill region was less accessible by water than most of the delta, so Clive had requisitioned a magic-propelled open-top carriage. Clive sat in the driver's seat, with the others in the back, when rain started coming down, droplets rolling off a magical barrier that covered the carriage. Normally invisible, it briefly shimmered blue as raindrops hit it. it. It actually doesn't say that. It says, normally invisible, it briefly shimmered blue as raindrops, and then, like, the sentence just stops, and, like, there's no period or other words or anything. That's kind of weird. What's that? Sophie asked with alarm. It's just a barrier to keep the rain off, Clive said. It only affects water. But where is the water coming from? She asked. Is a monster doing that? Clive looked back, sharing a confused glance with Humphrey and Jason. It's just rain, Jason said. Rain? You don't know what rain is? Jason asked. Oh, Humphrey said. Have you never left the city before? Not since I first went there as a girl, Sophie said, and that was when I was very young. I don't remember anything before that. Are you saying water just falls out of the sky somehow, normally? Yeah, Jason said. It doesn't rain in the city? I thought it just hadn't since I got here. It's one of the oddities of the local climate, Clive said. The combination of desert and the delta and the water affinity mass of greenstone making up the island impacts the weather in certain ways. One of those ways is that while it rains regularly in the Delta, it never actually rains in the city. That's weird, Jason said. How does the water get up in the sky? Sophie asked. It evaporates, Clive said. I thought you were going to say magic, Jason said. Then he and Clive, uh, between them, gave a basic example of the water cycle. The carriage continued as the rain grew heavier. Sophie and Jason both looked up at the water splashing off the invisible rain barrier. Jason with wonder and Sophie with wariness. While they were traveling along an embankment road through the marshes, Humphrey suddenly called out, Stop the carriage! He pointed off the side of the road, where a vortex of rainbow light was swirling in the air. What's that? Jason asked. A magical manifestation, Humphrey said. It's really rare to actually see them happen. What's a magical manifestation? Sophie asked. It's the natural manifestation of magic from the ethereal to the physical, Clive explained. Magic, coalescing into a physical form. Most likely it'll be a monster, but it could be an awakening stone or even an essence. Let's go take a look. How are we going to get out there? Humphrey asked. Jason can walk on water, but the rest of us can't. I can run on water, Sophie said. I think if I stop moving, though. I have something, Clive said. I was inspired by Jason's preparedness when we found a buried complex and... Found that buried complex, and I put a few things into my own storage space. They left the carriage and its rain barrier, so they started getting wet. Sophie looked trepidatiously up at the sky as they made their way down the steep embankment to the water's edge. From his inventory, Clive pulled out an entire raft which fell into the water. It tipped Clive off balance in doing so, and he went in with it and came up sputtering. 
The raft wasn't large, but had just enough room for Humphrey, Sophie, and Clive. Clive stood sodden at the front, his wet clothes tracing out his lanky frame. With a hand on the metal panel near the front of the otherwise wooden raft, he magically directed it to drift slowly in the direction of the colorful vortex. Jason simply walked alongside, his cloak both letting him walk on water and keeping off the rain. The vortex was around two meters across. Despite what looked like furious roiling, it didn't so do so much as disturb the air, as if it re didn't really exist at all. They stopped and waited for the process of manifestation to be complete. Are we all right to be this close? Sophie asked. It's fine, Clive said. It can't affect us, and we can't affect it without some high-end ritual magic. It's quite pretty, Jason said, taking out a recording crystal and tossing it up to float over his head. He started explaining the vortex for when he showed it to his family. After he had done that, he returned the crystal, he turned the crystal on Sophie. I've mentioned her earlier in previous entries, Jason said, but this is her in the flesh. My new bile slave girl, Sophie Wexler. Sophie was sitting on the raft, so her flashing jab caught him on the thigh. Ow! As you can see, she has some behavior pro be behavioral problems. Words. Sophie turned to Humphrey and Clive. If I drowned him out here, she asked, would you two back me up and say it was an accident? Absolutely, Clive said. Someone was going to do it sooner or later, Humphrey agreed. As you can also see, Jason said, she has ruthlessly suborned my minions. Did you just call us minions? Humphrey asked. Nope, Jason said. My voice just sounds weird because of the rain. They all waited several minutes before the vortex started to contract, growing smaller and smaller. It's not a monster, Clive said. I can see the magic taking form. It's going to be an awakening stone. Nice, Jason said. How do we decide who gets it? Miss Wexler needs it the most, Humphrey said. You and I only have a few spots left, and we should probably wait for Amir's event. Humphrey, you should call me Sophie, she said, flashing Humphrey a rare smile, before dropping it and turning to Jason. You shouldn't. Harsh, Jason said. You did just call her a slave girl, Humphrey said. I think you're misremembering, Jason said. That doesn't sound like something I'd do. I'm all about egalitarianism. The vortex continued shrinking until it was the size of a fist, coalescing into a blue awakening stone that fell into the water with a plop. The others all turned to look at Clive. What? he asked. You're alre you already went in once, Humphrey said. Clive saw the others were all unified, or were all a unified front and groaned as he dropped off the side of the raft. The water was only waist-deep, but he plun had to plunge down to his neck as he rummaged about for where the stone had dropped. It's times like this that I wish Onslow were a turtle instead of a tortoise, Clive said. Then he let out a yelp of pain, lurching to his feet and waving his arm around. A small figure was being flailed about, its teeth clamped onto Clive's hand. It was the size of a human hand with a naked androgynous body, blue hair, and insect wings that buzzed deeply to keep it aloft. Clutched in its arms was the awakening stone, almost as big as it was. The stone was wet, muddy, and under the weight of it, the creature could barely hold itself in the air. It tried to fly off with its prize, but the stone was too much, slipping through its arms and back into the water. A furious Clive made a grab for the creature, but it flitted away, turning back to poke out its tongue before zipping away through the air. I hate those things, Clive muttered, as he smeared healing ointment over the wound on his hand. You've seen those before, Jason asked. Wetland pixies? Oh yeah. They love eating eels, so they were always hanging about the farm I was growing up in. I can't tell you how many boots Nana lost throwing them at the damn things. She never actually hit anything, and the boots usually ended up in the bog. Well, you'd guess best get back down there and grab the stone, Jason said. There might be more of those things in there. Yes, George, you're a good kitty. Oh, come on. And that's the end of chapter 26. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, have fun, guys. You want to say hi to everyone? Say hi, George. Yeah, to the blue kitty. Bye, guys.